give your hands and let's praise him. We do come alive tonight. Thank you, Lord, for your presence, God, your anointing. Lord, we feel it. Lord, we worship you tonight. We've come to you with thanks and grace. And uh, Lord, we praise you tonight. Friend, I need the Lord. It's his strength that keeps me going. I've said that many, many times, but in today's world, the cry is for strength. But if y'all reach out to God tonight, I believe the Lord's anointing his worship, our worship to him. Friend, will strengthen you. And uh, isn't it great to be in the house of the Lord on a Wednesday night? Amen. Appreciate this youth band. They're doing a tremendous job. And uh, we're going to worship with them. Amen. God's doing good things. And God is good. And God is great. And God is wonderful. And I thank God for his presence. Amen. Worship with them as they sing. And you worship with them. Amen. Disappointment 
Would you love him right now? Anything is possible. Lord, we feel your presence in the house tonight. We feel the anointing right now, God. We submit to you. We hunger to you. Lord, we call upon you right now. Lord, we need your presence. And God, we're thankful for your grace tonight. Anybody here got any faith in the house? We heard a wonderful message Sunday, Brother Henry. That message or that text he had read, uh, one of them, Hebrews eleven six. I've had that on my mind for three or four weeks. In fact, I've been working on a sermon myself with that very text. But the Bible said you got to believe that he is. And uh, that's the first thing. Anybody here believe that he is? Yeah, he is. There is a God. He's a good God. He's a merciful God. Thank God. And then secondly, that is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. It's worth serving the Lord. And I feel the presence of the Holy Ghost on this beautiful Wednesday night. What an incredible day. And we welcome all of you. Just remain standing. We're going to go to the Lord. And it's good to be back in church. Had a, a great weekend. We appreciate the service Sunday and uh, everything we heard and felt. And all the testimonies. In fact, we're going to hear a testimony in just a moment. But we're going to pray while you're standing. And uh, was the most urgent need is with a Blackwell. And uh, I was hoping maybe she would be here. She said she might be there, try to come, but uh, pray for uh, him or the Blackwell. He does have pneumonia. He's still, of course, sedated uh, on the ventilator. And uh, But uh, each day it's kind of a up and then it's a down. But uh, thank God right now it's kind of up. And they were talking about brain activity and, uh, and some movement and things like that. So... We're claiming uh, the hand of God for him. And um, so pray for Brother Blackwell and Sister Blackwell, both of them. All of that's uh, very difficult. Sister Karen was in the hospital, uh, went home last night, but uh, I know she continues to need prayer. And uh, mentioned Sister D. Also, haven't mentioned Nathan in a while. I talked to that family a couple of days ago, but Brother Nathan Russell, he's uh, been at home, but. Uh, needing almost full-time attention, but pray for Nathan, all of that family. And uh, I thank God for every miracle we're hearing and seeing and testifying about. I believe in that. I, I believe enough, I'll keep believing and asking. And I, I shared last Wednesday, I think, or maybe Sunday, I had a phone call, and I won't go through the whole. But it was a man that had been, last time he'd been in church was 30 years ago. But he's going through what I would, call a crisis of faith and uh, Paul talked about the trying of your faith and I don't know how you interpret that verse but I've always kind of interpreted it this way it's not the tryings plural or not a trying but the trying I believe there comes in every life a trial that is so deep that you're on the edge and you could go one way or you could go the other way. Curse God and die or deepen your faith. And if there's anybody going through the trying of your faith, I mean, God doesn't judge us in the storm. He judges what comes out of the storm. And uh, it's kind of hard to be dignified when you've got, you're drowning with water in your boat. But if you'll just keep the faith to call on him, Amen. And that's what I'm going to do. No matter what happens, no matter what comes, no matter what doesn't happen, I'm going to keep trusting the Lord. Amen. And if you've got a need tonight, why don't you lift up your hands and we're going to believe tonight for his grace right now. Father, we're thankful for your hand. You're a good God and you're merciful, Lord, and your hand is everlasting to, to reach and to heal and to direct. And uh, we pray for these tonight, Brother Blackwell, Sister Blackwell, Karen and Dee and uh, all of these needs that have been presented on the screen, God, uh, by your authority and by the power of the name of Jesus Christ. Uh, I speak life. I speak wholeness. Uh, I believe in your power to heal, and we claim it right now. Let it be done in Jesus' name. Uh, in the name of Jesus, 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 uh, Jesus, Jesus. Thank you, God. Lord, we believe it tonight. Lord, we thank you for your grace and uh, we pray for it right now in the name of the Lord. Amen. And amen. God bless you. You may be seated for just a moment. And uh, before we worship again, I uh, appreciate the good uh, words that we've heard. And I want Brother Glenn to come. And uh, the Lord had really touched him. He wanted to share a testimony. 
And, uh, and uh, God bless you, Brother Glenn. Amen. Sunday, uh, I wanted to thank God. I was in the center aisle uh, praying. I had uh, John Perry with me, and we were praying, and, and, and I felt God moving. And um, I asked him, I said, Let, come with me up there. I want Brother Brian to pray for my shoulder, both my shoulders. I pulled it like a week ago, uh, picking up something heavy that, we put up there with a forklift and then I picked it up um, <laughs> and it was hurt really bad uh, the whole time I was up here praying for it to be healed it was hurting but I told myself if it's going to hurt it's going to hurt I'm still going to praise God through it uh, but uh, like brother Brian said we, we go through things so we think that God's not going to answer our prayer when we're going through something we have to be on our best behavior before he'll do something. But uh, I had enough faith. I came up here and uh, I had several people praying with me. and I had enough faith uh, that God would do it. I had Brother Brian pray for me. I asked him to uh, pray for my shoulder and pray for my son, Robert. Uh, and uh, I went and sat down. My arm wasn't hurting anymore. And Every time I raised my arm up to praise God, it, it was gone. I know it was hurting because when I was up here, it was hurting. So it's not like it just went away. It wasn't a sore. It was, it was hurting. Um, and uh, I was going to come up before the uh, guest speaker was about to come. But uh, I just couldn't find the right. I didn't want to just jump in front of him. So. I asked Brother Brian after service, I said, I'd like to testify Wednesday, but uh, I just wanted to get up here and, and testify. Um, you know, it seems like something small, but when something's hurting really bad, uh, it just don't go away. I just want to get up here and testify to God. <laughs> I think that's wonderful, Brother Glenn, and I don't think anything's too small. I think we ought to ask him for everything and uh, believe, and the uh, Bible said we're overcomers by the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony. And uh, the good thing about testimony, nobody can take that away from you. Uh, we can argue theology and debate the Bible and, and, and on and on and on, but well, your testimony is yours. And uh, that's why the man that was blind in John 9, they had no words they could say against him. They argued and who did this and whatever, but he responded, I don't know who his name is. I don't know nothing about his teaching, but I do know this. I once was blind, but now I see. And friend, they couldn't say a word. So uh, keep believing, keep asking. And uh, sometimes we think it's silly, but friend, God wants to move. Amen. And uh, I want to believe this. So thank you, Brother Glenn. Real quickly, I mentioned Easter's coming up a couple of weeks or so. Please get these cards are out in the foyer. Uh, leave them at work or leave them with some of your friends. We want to fill this house up Easter morning. We've got a great day planned for that morning, and that's only a couple of Sundays or so away, so invite them. Also, uh, the 24th, Brother A.J. Holloway will be speaking. Brother Holloway's been here a couple of times already. Incredible speaker. You will be blessed for that. I also want to mention uh, there is an election in St. Tammany Parish, uh, the 23rd. Most of you know that. If you haven't voted, I think it's a good civic duty to vote. Don't tell you how to vote, but uh, just vote. So pray for that. And I want Brother Ken to come and uh, uh, explain to you real briefly about a program we've got scheduled for April the 7th. And, uh, and God bless you. Brother Ken, come. God bless you. Appreciate it. Brother Ken, Sister Lynn, incredible people. Amen. God. Brother Brian wanted to... Uh, a little while back, he wanted to do a finance class. He asked me and my wife if we would uh, kind of lead it up. And we said yes. And, and I think the reason why is because about 
I think 2014, we went through this class over in Picayune at a, at a church there in Picayune, and just a handful of people, but uh, it's a class given by Dave Ramsey, Financial Peace University. And he teach basic stuff, just, just very basic stuff. First thing that caught my attention was live off less than what you make. Live off less than what you make. I mean, that's just, that's basic. That's, that's very basic. But you know, if you look around and you read books and look and read articles, you'll find that there's a lot of rich heathens. That's what I want. I want to use the word heathen. Because they don't live for God, they don't believe in God, but they use the principles of God to get to where they are. They, they've used the principles of God. God has good principles. You know, the bar is slave to the lender. We shouldn't be that, even though, you know, we've been there. My wife and I have been there. We started out with nothing, and for years we had nothing. We struggled, struggled. One day she wanted to take this class, and I didn't want to take it, but I said, I'll, I'll, I'll do it. And it's one of the best things we've ever done. We did. We, um, we don't struggle like we used to. We don't. And we, we vowed to cut off all our credit cards and, and completely get out of debt. For about almost two years, we stopped going out to eat. We stopped vacationing. We stopped everything so that we could pay off our house, and we did it. We did it. And um, it's hard to get transparent when it comes to money. Because, you know, when, when my relatives found out I would paid off my house, they started making a list of things I could bring to the family gathering. And it, and it was just about everything, you know. But, but you, 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 you don't want to be transparent, but at the same time you do. You want to let people know that if you use the right principles and if you stick with them, make the sacrifices, you can live like no one else today so that later on, this is Dave Ramsey's quote, later on you can live and give like no one else. And I'm asking everybody that will to sign up for the class. I won't be teaching the class. He will via the internet. But um, it's very interesting class and if you apply those principles to your life, you can later on live and give like no one else. And I'll leave that up there, Sister Lynn. This class is free to you. Church is buying all of these licenses for that, so normally it'd be $100. Uh, that begins April the 7th. That's a Sunday afternoon at 4 o'clock. It'll be for nine weeks, and uh, I promise it'll transform your life. You don't have to be homeless and on the street to need this class. And uh, when you've got financial problems, you've got financial bondage. Friend, I'll tell you what, it'll worry you to death. And uh, there's some biblical principles, I think, that if we can follow those and uh, work on it, uh, and, and we're doing it just to help all of us. So uh, take your camera and uh, shine it uh, right now right in that seat where you're at and uh, point your camera to that uh, QR code. It'll bring up our small group's uh, 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 link on there, and you can register right now. So we want to we want to get a good group on here, and uh, do thank Brother Ken, Sister Lynn. They are directing this program, and uh, again, no cost to you. So uh, God bless you. We may miss more of that. Ushers, come. We'll give you a chance to give. Thank you that we can give to the kingdom. God bless you. Let's worship with this youth band.
bless this youth band. Let's give them a hand. I appreciate their worship. And, uh, we're proud of these young people. These are good kids, and we're grateful they're living for the Lord, and uh, and we're going to be doing more of that, and let them lead to worship. Amen. We'll just stay in the book of Mark, and uh, God bless you. And we've got other young people next door with the quizzing, and so thank uh, all of these young people tonight, all of them with the music, and uh, and God bless them. Amen. I mean that. I appreciate these young people. They're not all going to the hogs and the dogs. I don't know if you've ever heard that expression, but uh, there's some kids that want to live for God. They want to do right, and we're proud that these are here. Book of Mark, chapter 10, verse 17. And Jesus uh, here in a story I was saying when he was going forth into the way, there came one running and kneeled to him. So he rushed to Jesus and he knelt and asked him, Good master, what shall I do that I may inherit eternal life? And that is the age old question. Every culture has asked about it. 
in some form. Is there life after death? And what do I have to do to get it? Jesus said unto him, Why callest thou me good? There is none good but one, that is God. Thou knowest the commandments, do not commit adultery, do not kill, do not steal, do not bear false witness, defraud not, honor thy father and mother. And he thought, if that's the test, I'm in. I aced that one. He answered and said to him, Master, all these have I observed from my youth. And that's pretty good because uh, Israel didn't do too good a job with it. And he answered and said unto him, Master, all these have observed from my youth. And Jesus, beholding him, loved him and said unto him, One thing thou lackest. Go thy way, sell whatsoever thou hast, and give it to the, or give to the poor. And thou shalt have treasure in heaven, and come, take up the cross, and follow me. And he was sad at that saying, and went away grieved, for he had great possessions. And it's a story of the rich young man. And friend, he had what all of us want. He was young. And he was rich. But there was one thing he lacked. And the master focused on that. And that's what stopped him. And for a little bit tonight, it's already 20 to 8. I I want to talk on this subject. Desire determines destination. Desire determines destination. Destination. I want to go to heaven, and uh, let me tell you the thing about possessions, friend. We're going to give them up one way or the other, either volunteer in that sense, but there's not going to be a corona beer party in hell. I promise you that. And Bud Light is not going to have a big market down there. And apparently they don't have a big one here because they've lost it, apparently. And I'm not trying to be silly, but you know what I'm saying. I can't give this up. No, we're going to give it up one way or the other. It's just the timing of it. And um, this young man had no real, real appreciation of the fact that I am turning away eternal life to hold on to this that I can't hold on to anyway. And uh, give me a few minutes. Desire determines destination. You may be seated. The text from Mark is a third of the picture of the man who approached Jesus on that day in the coastal regions of Judea. Judea, of course, being the southernmost part or portion of Israel. A profile of this man or this rich young man is given in Matthew and Luke. So there are three accounts of this story. John is strangely silent, and we know record nothing from John about the rich young man. The profile of those three accounts, uh, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, proves that he was a young man, Brother Matt, and he was a rich young man. And he held some position of authority. uh, He was a sort of ruler. So he had everything that that you'd think you'd want in life. He had position, he had power, he had money, and he had youth to do something with it. Because when you get a little bit older, friend, I promise you, it's not the 100-year-olds that's peeling rubber on Gall's Boulevard on a Friday night. After a while, you don't care what you got. You you can't do anything with it. He had it all. 
He was apparently a motivated young man. He was a principled young man, according to the scripture. And he must have invested his talents wisely. He didn't uh, uh, hoard them in the, in the sense that he had, he had done something in order to get wealth or increase wealth. I think the scripture would say that he loved God. <clears throat> he knelt at the presence of the Lord to worship him. He had the markings of discipline, which is an incredible gift to have. And so, by all accounts, if we had seen this rich young man and he had come to this church or any church, we would have said, I want that young man in my church. He's the kind of person we want. He loved the Lord, apparently, to some level, and he was disciplined and he was rich and he had power. But I think the approach that he has bears attention. He comes to Jesus with respect and submission and reverence. He was not antagonistic toward the Lord with this question. He knew that righteousness was synonymous with eternal life and entrance into the kingdom of heaven. The Bible said, Having therefore these promises, dearly beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness, in the fear of the Lord. And so he understands these principles because when Jesus asked him, you know, have you considered the commandments? What shall I do? Thou knowest the commandments. And he was able to say quickly, look, I've done these things all my life. And by today's standard, that would be an outstanding young man. We'd be proud to have him as your son, a brother in the Lord, whatever you want to call him. And uh, he knew that righteousness was synonymous with eternal life. And so great, great emphasis is placed on that concept of righteousness. And friend, I believe that spirituality and conduct are inseparable, that a true relationship with God is going to affect my behavior it marks a man. It separates a man from the world. And uh, when you come to God, friend, you don't live like you used to live. And it's disturbing, uh, Mike, that you see so many church folks, and I, I, I don't judge. I, I'm not in the judging business. But, friend, when I come to God, I, I think there ought to be a difference. And if there isn't a difference, why come to God? Just keep doing what you're doing. But, but friend, I believe that that's manifest in my behavior. And uh, this young man understood that principle. He was not so caught in the world that he didn't have time for God because he had, he had obeyed those commandments which had come from God. And so the Lord asked him this question, and this was relating to what I call the externals of life. The second question the Lord's going to ask him is the internals of life. Here was the first question that he asked, what shall I do that I might inherit eternal life? And when Jesus answers that question, brother man, he resorts to the law, and he proved two things by going to the law, he being Jesus. One, that the law was a revelation of the holiness of God. It shows men what God desires. And those commandments were not suggestions, as some have said, but the law was a revelation of the holiness of God. Now, friend, we've made God in America a big teddy bear, sugar daddy that answers questions, uh, uh, needs like a genie. And, uh, and friend, God goes me, owes me a Cadillac and, and, and a chicken in every pot. And I'm being a little facetious, but you know what I'm trying to say. But really, the law was a revelation of the holiness of God. He is a holy God. And then the law defined the requirements of holiness by showing men how God wanted men to walk. That was the purpose of the law. And this young man had fulfilled those requirements. He had done all those, and yet there was still something missing in his life. And he could declare that what he had done, Brother Matt, was, was completely satisfying and pleasing in the sight of God. But friends, serving God is more than just fulfilling the externals of life. It's more than being able to say that the law has been upheld. 
there's some requirements that God gives that come when we least expect them. And that was what I think is revealed in this rich young ruler because there was a second question. And uh, that is what was inside of him. The outside can display great feats, but the inside can be weak as water, and yet no man can see them. And so Matthew's account, and I'm reading from Matthew 19.20, after Jesus asked the first question, or he asked the first question, and Jesus answers him, then the young man asked this question, what lack I yet? And that question, I think, is embedded, I hope, in every man and woman in this room. It's not a question of fear or embarrassment or that my image will be tarnished or whatever. But God, is there something that I am lacking? And uh, the answer comes to light when we look at the life of this young man. He was so disciplined, he was so motivated that he had fared well. And uh, the future held bright things for this rich young ruler. Some people don't like discipline. It chafes and it irritates. And, uh, and uh, we live in a world that's kind of thrown discipline aside. But friend, you can go a long way with discipline. And that's the ones that will control and work hard and get up early. And, and uh, you know, there's rewards in that. Anybody know that? And that's the way the whole world used to be. But it seemed like today we're you know, just, I don't care anything about that. Uh, all of you that hire workers uh, today, friend, there's a, there's a huge need of workers that will just show up on time, sober, ready to work. And I'll tell anybody that shows up on time, sober, ready to work, you're ahead of probably 90% that's out there. So if you want to excel, just do that. I'm not even talking about the quality of your work at this point. Just show up. Because some of them ask, do I have to show up to get a check? Well, that's kind of the principle of the thing. And, uh, and this young man had done that. I mean, he, he probably wasn't rich for accident. And uh, this story, friend, I think shows what's missing in a lot of lives. He, this story is sandwiched between two great events in the life of Jesus. When you look at the Scripture, because preceding this one is the story of blind Bartimaeus. And uh, he got what he wanted from God because he was persistent. Following the rich young ruler is the cursing of the fig tree. And each is a mirror in some way of this rich young ruler. Because the fig tree illustrates to us that life that is full of discipline and has all the externals or nothing if there's no fruit. <clears throat> And the healing of Barnabas proves to us the importance of desire. So that was the plight of this rich young ruler, full of discipline, but one thing he lacked. And what was that? Well, I think it was desire. He wanted eternal life, but we're not sure if he wanted the Lord. Because the Bible said that Jesus knew and we know he knew. He said, one thing you're lacking. You go and sell this and you follow me. Now, what would have happened since Wilson, that young man said, is that all I have to do? Give me 30 minutes and I'm going down to the stock market or down to Deep South Gold. You know what Dave Wilson brought in to show me a while ago? He showed me two gold caps off of some man's teeth. What's that? So young, some man had two gold caps on his teeth and he sold them at Deep South Gold <laughs> and they bought them because it's gold and so <laughs> and that's the business they're in. And um, this young man, friend, I'm going to tell you what. The Bible said he, he was missing one thing, and the master said, you follow me. And if he'd have said, is that all there is to it, I'll sell it, and I'll be back. 
Sister Lois, I don't believe the Lord would have required him to actually sell that. I've always believed that. Because Jesus is going to tell Peter, you know, you give to me and see if I won't restore 30, 60, or 100-fold back to you in this life. Not just eternal life, but this life. In other words, God's such a blessing, God. But it showed one thing that he liked, and that was, I call it desire. And friend, desire determines my destination. You know, God wants to be wanted, and he wants to be desired. And we, he wants us to hunger after him. Not his miracles and not his blessings, but him. And friend, if a man or a woman will hunger after him, friend, the Bible lets us know all things are possible and all things are open. But I'm going to tell you what, desire was the one that pressed that widow through the crowd to touch the hem of the garment. Desire was one that took Zacchaeus and put him up a sycamore tree in Luke 19. And uh, desire took a palsied man and lowered him down through the roof. And uh, desire made Bartimaeus cry <clears throat> louder and Desire compelled that Syrophoenician woman to keep pleading for her child. And desire made her, Rahab, risk her life, friend. I'm going to tell you what. It's desire that determines determination or destination. And I want to have that desire for God. And not just a miracle and not whatever that God does for me. You've heard it read, and my wife and I were in Alaska some years ago, thanks to this church, we had a cruise, and, and uh, Alaska is noted for its salmon, as well as the northwest part of the United States, and they have one called the Alaskan Steelhead, it's called the Chinook, it's a salmon that averages about 20 pounds in weight, that's a pretty good sized fish. That uh, fish will be born in the cold waters of Alaska, and it will begin a trek until it emerges into the Pacific Ocean. That fingerling is probably two to three inches when it reaches the ocean, and it'll remain in that ocean until it goes back to spawn. And that trip will take one to 2,000 miles in the life of that fish. And the migratory instinct of that salmon family is so specific Friend, that it will go back to the same river and back to the same spawning bed from which it emerged before. And once it's reached that spawning area, it will leave as many as 20,000 eggs in October, November, and then it will drift downstream and die. And friend, it is a desire in that fish to continue life and it'll, it'll spawn and go, uh, go upriver, and you know the story. And uh, one is your point, Pastor. Friend, I'm going to tell you what. A lot of folks love the Lord for what he gives them. But friend, God wants us to love him for what he is. And uh, if I can get that desire in my heart, friend, I'm going to tell you what. God's desire is that we desire him. And what one thing this young man lacked, he didn't desire the Lord enough that, that those riches separated him. And I believe if he had responded, Brother Fred, in the affirmative, God would have let him keep it. I believe that and would have granted him that. Desire, friend, it's a big word. It can be natural desire, desire for food, desire for fellowship, desire for those things. How do you know if a desire is good or bad? Well, the answer lies in the object that you're desiring. If it's self-centered, it might not be so good, but it, uh, if it's an act of desiring the Lord, friend, it'll always be good because when the Lord is our greatest desire, the Bible lets us know thing, all things are possible. And that's why the Lord told him in the book of Matthew, seek the kingdom of heaven first. And, uh, friend, I'm going to tell you what, desire moves the Lord. And God, let me let him know I want him. Anybody want the Lord? Amen. And that's why the Lord always said, you seek my face, don't seek my hand. 
my hand is my blessings, it's my miracles. But I, he never told us to seek his hand. Uh, he said, seek my face. Uh, and if you'll seek my face, uh, then I'll give you my hand. Uh, and all things are open and all things will be given uh, to those. So seek the kingdom of heaven. Uh, all these things will be added to them. Anybody really want the Lord? I want the Lord. God, I seek you because desire determines destination. We see that over and over. Luke chapter 19, there was a man by the name of Zacchaeus. I already mentioned him. The Bible said he, he was there and he was chief among the publicans, not the republicans, but the publicans. Brother Ron shared who those were. And the Bible said he was rich. And he wanted to see who Jesus was and he could not for the press. Now that's not the daily news. I said it was a crowd because he had short man syndrome. He was little of stature. And you know the story, Luke 19, he climbs up into a sycamore tree for he knew that the Lord was to pass that way. Friend, here's a rich man. Probably, since the Lord was full of pride, and he had a position as a publican, and yet he said, I want the Lord. And he was willing to climb a tree while the Lord was coming by. And when the Lord came to that place, he looked up and he said, Zacchaeus, make haste and come down for today. I must abide at thy house. And friend, if I want the Lord to abide in my house, I've got to want him first. And he made haste and came down and received him joyfully. And everybody else was saying, wait a minute, they murmured. Doesn't, they, don't Jesus know that he just went inside a house with a sinner? And uh, yeah, Jesus knew. But he knew there was something in that man's heart. Here's what the message is, and I got to hurry to close. Zach wasn't going to let circumstances dictate his destination. He was going to let his desire dictate his destination. He wasn't going to let the fact he was a sinner. He wasn't going to let the fact that he was small in size. He wasn't going to let the fact that, friend, that uh, the crowd was there. The Bible said, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate me from the love of God. Friend, if there is a desire, God will supply the means to reach your destination. And God supplied the sycamore tree. And I'm going to tell you what, uh, 15 or 20 or 30 or 40 years prior to this day, a seed fell into the ground beside the road, uh, and a little tree sprouted up, uh, and it was the providence and the hand of God, uh, and God watered it and nurtured it, uh, Brother Magoo, because he knew 40 years from later there was a man going to come and uh, going to express a desire, and he needed that tree, and the tree was going to be there. And friend, if there's a desire, God will supply the means up to reach my destination. And if I want to see God move in my life, I, I got to start looking for a sycamore tree. Something to show God that I want him. And I hope this makes a little sense. I've said this a lot. You know what's wrong in a lot of marriages, in my opinion, is the companion doesn't feel wanted. They feel maybe needed, they feel used, may even feel abused, but they don't feel wanted. And I think if a, a partners could just make their companion feel like, I want you, I think that would go a long way to healing a lot of marriages. Because it's the same principle with the Lord. God said, I'm a blessing God, I'm a giving God, I'm a good God, but it's going to start because I think you want me. Anybody here want the Lord tonight? I don't want to be a professional Christian, a professional Pentecostal. I don't want to just know how to do the ropes and clap my hands when I'm supposed to and uh, 
give when I need to and whatever, friend. I, I want the Lord to know, Sister Lord, I love him. He's the best thing that ever happened. Father, you've been good to me. I want you. I desire your presence in my life, and I pray, God, your will be done. But that desire, friend, is what drives me, and I promise you it will determine your destination. What was Judas's desire? Well, it was money. And his destination was hell. The woman with the issue of blood, she desired to be touched. And her destination was the feet of Jesus. And Achan was driven by silver and gold. And his destination was the valley of Achor, which is the valley of trouble. And it was a death sentence. Paul and Silas were driven by praise and worship. And their destination was a jailbreak at midnight. Friend, what desires do I have? Uh, because that will determine uh, my destination. Uh, and I'm asking God, God, uh, would you do please uh, put in my heart uh, a fresh desire? Because, Jen, I'm going to tell you what. You can admire something but not desire it. I've looked at them men that worked on those skyscrapers, 100 Stories up in the air, friend, I admire them, but I don't desire to be like them. You can admire something and not desire it. And this young man admired Jesus, but he didn't desire him because Jesus said, I'm going to put it right in front of you. If you follow me, I'll give you eternal And the sad thing is, everything that I think I can't give up, I am going to give up one day. And, uh, and if that's what's keeping me between me and eternal life, then I need to remember, friend, I'm going to tell you what, I will give it up one day. And uh, you know, God's a good God. God's a blessing God. God's been good to me. God's been good to you. And I want the Lord to know, God, I want you. I thank you for every miracle. I thank you for every blessing. I thank you, Brother Glenn, every time he's touched a shoulder at a prayer request. I thank you for the checks in the mail. We've got folks in here, friend, you are just bona fide witnesses of Deliverance from the Lord. I thank God for every miracle I've seen, Brother Fred, and we've all seen miracles. But friend, it's not any of that. It's Him. Father, let me fall back in love with you again. And uh, I close. Would you stand? Friend, my desire determines my destination. As the Bible said, he said, I'll give you the desires of your heart. And the question is, what am I desiring? Because God said, I'll give you that. I wonder, as they worship and conclude with the worship song, if we will lift our hearts to the Lord right now. I need to repent. I'm going to repent. But Lord, let my heart and my spirit turn back to you. It begins with that right now. Father, thank you for this. Let's worship. Amen. Thank God. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, God. God, I thank you. And let the Lord know you want them more of you. God, I want more of you, Jesus.
Amen. Lord, there's no place, Father. I want you. I want you, Jesus. Thank you for your love, Lord. Thank you for your grace to us. Amen. God, I love you tonight. I thank you tonight. God, I want more of you. Amen. I'm going to ask you to do something tomorrow when you pray, friend. Why don't you start that prayer and maybe just do the whole prayer tomorrow of worship to him and hungering after him. Amen. And God said, if you'll seek me, I'll add all those other things, the things that we normally pray about mostly. But friend, I'm going to seek the Lord. Amen. And let that desire begin to grow because desire will determine my destination. Amen. Amen. Would you love the Lord one more time before you go? God, I thank you tonight. I praise you, Lord, for your goodness. And amen, amen, amen. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. And uh, amen. God bless this youth band one more time. We appreciate these young people. And uh, they did a great job. Go in peace. God bless you. Amen.